This is the third, probably the last and definitely the most safest of the Gillian's Diamonds uh, videos, which is the based on the lamp that has this sort of diamonds flowing in the liquid. And this is a low voltage version. This is USB powered, this version. And to design it, uh, I designed a small circuit board. This was the first sketch, which had the resistor for heat across the middle with the pads going straight to the resistor. Oh, let me draw, draw this schematic. USB in, just a standard five volt supply. So that's five volts zero volts and it's got the resistor straight across that for the heat so there's the hot resistor round about 4.7 ohms to 10 ohms depending on the beefiness of your power supply a one amp power supply a 10 ohm resistor will pass about 500 milliamps i always recommend if you're using a usb power supply under run it the leds initially for the 16 leds i had four resistors with four leds in parallel in each resistor not great but uh, it also means you can't mix colors of leds if you run them in parallel to that and also the current may be imbalanced between them but i improved that in the end i allowed for a resistor per two leds so if i draw four leds and they're all effectively in parallel with resistors across the supply because the we've only got five volts to play with so I've bridged them in parallel pairs with a resistor per pair. And the resistor value is about 100 ohms, which uh, will give about um, 10 to 15 milliamps per LED. So when I uh, designed the circuit board, this is how it turned out. BCDC, keep in mind this is uh, you looking from the front of the circuit board to the back. It's got the high power resistor in the middle, it's got the two really chunky pads for connecting onto. Everything's done with chunky tracks to make it easy to make. All the resistors, I found that I could shuffle the resistors about to fit all the ones in that are required. And you can see that all the LEDs have a common positive outer rail going around the outside. And then the inside, they're combed in pairs, and then going via a resistor onto the common negative rail that jumps up and down between all the resistors and also feeds the main resistor. So let's uh, build this. This isn't going to be a super full length video, just uh, because uh, it would be quite long. I did one fairly recently that was very similar. So here is the, I'll show you the uh, putting together of the laminate. So here's a piece of uh, fiberglass laminate uh, circuit board. And this is called FR4 laminate that's to do with the fire returnancy rating. And it's a fiberglass, laminated fiberglass sheet with a thin layer of copper on top. And this is uh, what we're going to do to make the circuit board. We're going to etch away the copper we don't want. And to do that, we're going to be use this cheap material off eBay called dry film photosensitive resist, photo resist. This stuff is, I'm really taking a shine to it now. It's been proving to be very, very nice to work with. Less aggressive chemicals and just tolerant to making the circuit boards just so much better than the older uh, pre-sensitized boards that were sometimes a bit problematic. So I'm going to wrap this back, back in its uh, plastic wrap and I'm going to tuck the ends in. And we're going to put this onto the layer of the circuit, the circuit board. We're going to seal it on. And to do that, we're going to be using water and a squeegee. I've not got the squeegee one, but we're just going to grab it. Here we go. Everything from eBay. This is a uh, vinyl uh, squeegee for putting vinyl signs on windows and cars and things like that. So this stuff uh, is a layer of very thin gel sandwiched between two sheets of plastic. This is going to sound a bit deja vu to MD who's seen other projects. It's going to be very similar to other projects. So feel free to skip through the video if you find it's going to be a bit long and repetitive. So. I put a bit of tape on one side at one corner and a bit of tape on the other side at the other corner and then peel them apart and hopefully, and it doesn't always work, hopefully at the corner it's going to start peeling off one of the protective layers. It didn't. This, uh, this is a recurring theme of this particular batch of the film. It sometimes doesn't separate that easily. That's okay, you just have to persist a little bit until it does it. There we go. So a clear layer has come off and that means the side that's being exposed is one layer of the gel and you can feel a slight stickiness. So I'm going to remove this uh, bit of sellotape. And before I lay this onto the circuit board, I'm going to spray the circuit board with water. Now I used an ultrasonic mister last time. This time it's going to be a very ordinary set of atomizer from Poundland. 
So I'm just going to mist this with a small amount of water, not too much, it doesn't need to be much. It will spread out. And then, just like when you're putting a protective screen in your mobile phone, you just kind of lay it gently on and it will inevitably trap little air bubbles and things like that. The main thing, you don't want too much in the way of dust and it doesn't have to cover the whole thing because we'll just selectively use what we need. So now I'm going to squeegee the water out of that and hopefully squeegee all the air out too. I used quite a lot of water that time. That's looking very good. Oh, I'm getting so good at this now. You get a certain amount of working time. If you did this in daylight, it would potentially start making it react immediately, this stuff. It's not ideal. So you want to do it in subdued light or general sort of work light, indoor work light. Not at a window. It's ultraviolet light that uh, makes this cure, as you'll see later on. And I've got an iron here, and the iron is set at its lowest setting that I can really do. It's almost set at the absolute minimum to the point that when I turned it on, it just came on for a few seconds and off again. It's kind of, I can touch the front but not hold my hand on it too long. And now I'm going to use that to try and heat the laminate here. And that will uh, finish the job of sealing the gel on to the copper. So I'm going to take my time doing that. Maybe just nudge this up a little bit more. This is tempting fate. I found that if the temperature's too high, it makes the plastic coating that's still left on this wrinkle, which isn't a good thing. It may also mean that if there's any moisture at all left underneath, it might drive it out the gel and uh, cause it to bubble up in that area. It's all a matter of practice. The only way you can get used to doing something like this is with practice, but that looks pretty good. Now, there is a protective plastic layer in this. I'm leaving that on. It's very, very, very thin. I've found that in the past, that if you put the transparency straight on it, then you end up, it tends to stick onto the gel. And there's, as you pull the transparency off, it can damage the transparency and the gel. I'm just going to get the transparency now. Yeah, sorry, not to organise this video. Here is my transparency, which has been printed off onto screen printer's uh, transparency film. It's inkjet printed, but this particular film is really quite unusual. It's very, very uh, absorbent. It absorbs a lot of ink, and it seems to do it long ways into the material. So you end up with a very, very sharp image that dries almost immediately, and it produces a very black image. It's great for this stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, put this on a section of this circuit board. I'm going to chop it off just what I need. And I'm going to expose it to ultraviolet light. And once I've done that, we'll then develop it. So I'll be back in a moment. This is my ultraviolet exposure unit. It's quite a posh one. The tubes are all in the lid. Uh, quite large tubes as well. So I'm going to place the material in here. I'm going to place the uh, transparency on it in a suitable position. Close the lid down latch it at the sides and press start and the unit has um oh blame how many has it got i think it's got six uh one of these holes is for each if you notice the green glow at the side it's because uh there's green tube light on permanent test so it's got uh, six tubes with holes that you can actually see it operating uh, to make sure all the tubes are working and it's got this timer console and a magnet, so when you lift the lid up, it sort of cancels the timer, it turns the lights off. So basically a safety interlock, although it's not a harmful wavelength of ultraviolet. It is effectively this sort of black light ultraviolet. And uh, I tend to keep uh, a wee note of the, uh, say for instance, a dry film 60 seconds. These other ones are for the older types of uh, exposure that I did, the pre-coated circuit boards. And this all sits rather conveniently on top of my condenser tumble dryer here. How convenient. It makes a nice platform. Everything makes a good platform in this house. So uh, I think this was made by Mega Electronics. It was really expensive at the time, but it was, it was essential because uh, ultimately uh, I was making a lot of circuit boards. It just made sense to get one of these units. So now if I... Open this up and I lift the transparency off, you'll see the instant transition that's happened here. So that has uh, exposed perfectly. This, the 60 seconds is perfect for this, so let's go and develop it right now. Developing is done with a solution of sodium carbonate, 4 grams in 125 milliliters of warm water. Sodium carbonate, very easy to get here in the UK, well here in the Isle of Man, 
I got it at a local supermarket. All the supermarkets have it. Standard washing soda crystals. Sodium carbonate, not sodium bicarbonate, although you can convert sodium bicarbonate into sodium carbonate by heating it, or you could just get a really cheap big bag of this stuff out of the supermarket. Much easier. I was caught out. I bought high purity, proper lab grade stuff online before realizing it was available in the supermarket in huge bags. Cheaply, how annoying. So take a bit of cello tape, and this is the bit I usually forget, and it's quite annoying when you do it. And put it on the film at the corner. And this time you'll want to try and lift off the other protective film. If you don't do that, you can put it in the liquid for as long as you like. It's never ever going to develop. And this now goes into the solution. And I've also got a sponge. I'm just going to grab the sponge because I've left it behind. Here we go. This sponge. Incidentally, I used the same bath uh, kitchen scourer to uh, clean the bare copper laminate before doing this. It provides a better surface for it to adhes adhesion to adhere to. Uh, there, I'll get the I'll get the grammar right at some point. So you jiggle it up and down in the liquid, and then sort of wave it away. This is where the sponge comes in handy because you can just it's really robust. This stuff underneath, you can just sponge the surface. And as I do this, you'll notice it getting lighter and lighter until the actual area of copper here is exposed to the same level as this bit that's not even got the stuff on it. And what's actually happening here is that where the ultraviolet has hit the material, it's hardened it, it's cured it, and it's set onto the uh, circuit board material. And it really does create, you can actually feel the thickness of this. It, it's a thick layer that you can actually, when you run your fingers over it, you can feel the sort of texture, almost like a, was it a, was it thermographic printing? I remember there's a print that they uh, uh, put. Basically, the printing process applied a powder that was then heated, and it produced a thick print on paper. So this is looking very good. I have to say that uh, now I've discovered that 60 seconds is enough, that's made a huge difference because I wasn't doing that before. I was giving it far too long. I thought it was going to take as long as the original uh, types of circuit board material I used. And now that the exposure time is shorter, it means that it's uh, coming off a lot easier because beforehand it was long enough to just basically start curing the stuff that was supposed to be coming off. And that also, because it seeped underneath the sort of sideways underneath the, uh, through the gel, it created a slight overexposure between the pads and that resulted in the material between the pads not uh, coming off, which was annoying because it meant I had to clean them afterwards when after etching because there was a little layer of copper there. But now it's looking pretty good and you get such a long working time with this that you can just keep going for a while to make sure you've got absolutely everything off. But as you can see, it's pretty much exposed right through to the copper now. Excellent. And the next step of the process is to put it in ferric chloride. I will be trying the other etchants over time uh, once I've found, found the technique to use them. At the moment, ferric chloride is uh, not just the messy, messiest uh, one for developing, but it's, uh, it's, it works really well. It's just something I'm very used to, so that's what I'm going to keep using. So I'm going to rinse this off now and etch it. Here's the ferric chloride. I've heated it up in a Tupperware container as opposed to the sealed sleeve Sino GS system, which is very clean, but just a wee bit harder to heat the microwaves a lot faster when you can just put the Tupperware container with the lid loose in it. And what I'm going to do, initially I'm going to submerge it. I've cropped this down to reduce the amount of copper that has to be etched away. That protects, that saves the liquid. And I'm going to just... Uh, Put it in for a moment and then take it back out and you can see that there's no shiny bits at all. That has gone completely matte instantly, which means there's no resist left. If you put it in and bits were remaining really super coppery shiny, that means that the, uh, the, uh, printed, the resist was still intact there. So this looks fine. So I'm going to put this in, I'm going to agitate it for quite a while, but I'm going to pause because uh, this takes a while. Now I have to work out how to turn off the camera with my fingers covered with ferric chloride. Excellent! The circuit board is now fully etched and it's come out really nice and clean. No residual copper in between the pads at all. It's superb. So now I'm going to drill it. I'm going to be using a 1mm tungsten carbide drill bit. I get these in packs. Uh, was this bought online or was this bought from Rapid Electronics? I think this was this set were bought online. Oh no, these probably did come from Rapid. 
Not sure. Uh, some of the other ones I bought, I got a mixed set, and they uh, had little plastic collars on them, suggesting they were from the machines. So I'm going to drill this by hand now. Other people have said, well, let's start drilling. Other people have said, why don't I use a drill press for this? A couple of practice holes, incidentally, just to get the feel. Uh, and the answer is because uh, with a drill press, it wouldn't be as fast as this. I can drill these holes really quickly by hand. Now, one thing about the tungsten carbide drill bits is they're very, very brittle. So you have to be very careful to support the drills properly. If you are sloppy about it at all, the drill will crack. You also want to avoid touching it to your flesh because it's got a very, very bad habit of just snatching and biting into your, your skin. They're very sharp, it's horrible. I did that once. Right up the end of a finger, literally up the end of the finger and it snatched and it went in really deep. It was horrific, quite uncomfortable for many days afterwards. I've also dropped it on my thigh, which wasn't terribly helpful because once again it snatched into the thigh. Yeah, if it's possible to have any accident with a drill, I've probably had it just because, you know, when you're using drills all the time, that's what happens. This is the peril of working. Oop, I'll just smack the, uh, smack the camera with the skip of my baseball cap. Why do I even have a baseball cap on? It's, I've been in for quite some time. I think it's just habit. Now, I leave a small indent in the middle of these uh, pads, just uh, more or less the same size as if it was being manufactured. In this case, it's 0.8 millimeter. I find it just helps really line the drill up. Now that I know that I can get a really super clean etch from this new printed circuit board material, the uh, photosensitive resist, with a shorter exposure time, I may actually revert back to 0.5 millimeter holes for the prototypes because that just gives you a tighter, closer uh, alignment. Because what's actually happening here, though it's only a tiny thickness of copper, it is still enough to help guide the drill in. And it means I don't have to be so critical. As long as I hit that middle of that pad, it will pretty much guide itself through the material. And as you can see, they're drilling very quickly. This uh, drill is a mini craft. It's an old mini craft. Uh, it runs at 12 volts. And I got it from RME, Radio Mechanical Electrical, in Howard Street in Glasgow. Only the old timers will remember that place. It's not there anymore, which is a shame. It was uh, the epicentre of electronic geeks at the weekend. They just, all these quiet people just milled round. Uh, turn that over, is that it drilled? Yes, that is it drilled. All the holes are complete. Yeah, RME, Radio Mechanical Electrical, was just basically almost like an electronic junk shop, but with new stuff as well, and it was just great. Yeah, it was just really nice to mill around in it at the weekend. It was just one of those places that you always visit at the weekend. So what I'm going to do now, actually, let's do it right now. I'm going to start guillotining this off, so I'll be back in a second. My guillotine. This, uh, I've mentioned it before, it's quite an expensive thing. It's not something that you're going to get unless you are doing a lot of circuit boards. But uh, in a production environment, it just it's worth its weight in gold. It is really good. And I'm going to basically do a rough cut. I've got this circle here that I want to sort of trim down to. And initially I'll cut the corners off. And then I'll sort of hone that down a bit and then I'll take the Dremel to it. And once I've done that uh, and I've got it nice and round, I will remove the resist from it, which I do with caustic soda, sodium hydroxide, lye. Uh, you just put it into some drain cleaner, lye, sodium hydroxide, caustic soda, so many names. Or you could use a nail varnish remover as well. The acetone works pretty well. So I'm going to hone this down, just going to crop this off. Other things you could use to do this, uh, it will take a bit longer, but you could use a pack saw to do this. A bit messier than a guillotine. The guillotine is great, but as I say, they're pretty expensive. They're only really suited to a factory environment, but that is more or less a sort of roundish. So I'm going to finish that off. I'm going to use this to uh, 
basically take the, well, take the driller already. I'm going to put this in. I'm going to clean it around the edge. Uh, this will take a wee bit of time uh, and make lots of dust everywhere. And then I'm going to clean this off and then I'll come back and we'll solder it together. All rounded off, all clean and looking good. So let's put the components in. So I've got the 8 to 100, 100 ohm resistors here, and the logic behind that, the choice of resistor, is that it's going to be, it's not going to be running the LEDs full whack at 20 milliamps. You could do that if you wanted, but keep in mind there are two in parallel. I'm allowing for the fact there'll be a slight current imbalance. And the case of red LEDs, it runs about 15 milliamps. The case of blue and green, it runs about 20 milliamps. That means that even if one LED was drawing all the current, it would uh, not be overloaded. So it's not going to do it. It's going to balance out. And it's also by underrun the LEDs, it's going to last a good length of time. So this is a component former. I got this off eBay. It was from a UK supplier. It wasn't that expensive. Very, you know, they're not that popular on eBay at the moment. I'm guessing they'll become more popular. It's fairly new to me, this particular style. But if you look for a component lead former, you may find it. You've got a choice of different widths, and that's the distance between the pad. So in this case, if you lay on the pads, you'll see that this one here is what we want for a typical component. The resistor won't fit in this hole. Fitting better, fitting better, but fits perfectly in that one. Hold it down, fold the leads down, and that is it perfectly formed without putting too much strain in the component itself. So much uh, cheaper, actually quite easy also. I'll just uh, remove that little flake of stuff. Uh, so much easier and more convenient than actually the expensive tool, but it does at least crop the leads down as well. So eight resistors for the 16 LEDs, two LEDs per resistor. And then I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to do a mixture of blue and red LEDs again because I like the blue and red mix because it's at the opposite end of the spectrum. And I may experimentally, I may do two blue, two red, two blue, two red. I think I did that with the last one. Uh, let's put the resistors in. Let me bring in my drawing here. Just to remind me of where they go. So that's the BCDC goes to the top. The resistors go in like this. I'm just slapping them anywhere. I'm not even going to line them up with the uh, bands in the same direction. It's just not necessary. Try and get out habits of doing things like that. I suppose it's neat. You notice that uh, a lot of my circuit boards are very, very symmetrical. Oh, you know what? So many of the resistors have already gone in the same orientation that I'm going to end up putting them all in the same orientation. Anyway, because it looks neater, doesn't it? I like uh, symmetry. I like symmetry in the circuit boards. It often, in the case of this design, it fits as well. It's just a nice thing. So tomorrow, well, the, not uh, this was uh, video is going to be released uh, in a number of days later, but uh, tomorrow is the meet uh, in Gl the Isle of Man for the uh, channel. So I wonder how much sleep I'll get tonight. Last year when I had my first ever meetup, I didn't get much sleep at all. It was a bit like, oh no, how many people are going to turn up? I advertised a wee bit earlier this time, so uh, more will turn up hopefully. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should turn the soldier iron on. The soldier iron works so much better when it's hot. In the meantime, I'm going to start cropping some LEDs. So let's start the red. As I mentioned in the last video, the reason it says vivid red, it's not the colour, it was the supplier I used at the time. When I uh, was buying quite a lot of LEDs, it's before they became available cheaply on eBay, although the quality on eBay was somewhat more dubious. Uh, the I was buying them from China. Some are saying, why do you not leave the leads full length when you're soldering them in? And the answer is because it gives better access to the solder joints when you're doing quite a few at once. I note that long lead is to the short leg inside the LED and the short lead, the cathode, is on the anvil that holds the reflector. So it's quite easy to remember which way around they go. I've actually forgotten what colour these are. These are red, red LEDs. You can tell by looking up the end of the LED because it looks slightly different to the gallium nitride blue ones. I might get a bit paranoid, I might just stuff it into an LED tester. Do I have an LED tester handy? Yes, I do. Remind me, did I start the red LEDs? Yes, I did. Bright red. These LEDs are actually quite old, but they're still very good. 
I wish I could find a source of super quality LEDs at sensible prices online. I suppose there is one somewhere, but it's definitely not eBay. eBay is very random for LEDs. So let's set these component cuttings out the way. And I shall solder these resistors in. So, generic solder iron. This is my Yahua 8786D. It's a combined solder iron and uh, I've also sort of, well, the, kind of it's supposed to be a hot work reflow type station. It's a hot air type station, but um, I just use it mainly for heat shrink and peeling sticky labels off. It's good at uh, loosening the glue on, say, warranty labels, just in case you want to open something while it's under warranty. So I'm just going to uh, solder through. Now, I've left the leads at full length on the resistors, just because of the way I did it there. And that does impede access to the solder iron at times. That's okay. And the technique for soldering is, of course, apply the solder iron to the pad and the lead, and then the solder. It does really help, and it is perfectly acceptable to touch the solder onto the solder iron once you've got them uh, on the pad and the lead, because the Liquid solder actually helps make the heat onto the pads and the leads starts the process going. So almost there with the resistors and then I'm going to put the circuit board in a jig for the other components, the LEDs. And the main resistor, the power resistor, is actually already siliconed to the bottle. It's just curing at the moment. I'll show you that afterwards. Because I thought it was going to be easier just to actually silicon that onto the uh, glass bottle before putting it onto the circuit board, and then effectively I can slide the circuit board over the leads, if it works okay. We'll see what happens. That's looking okay there, more or less sitting flat and nice. That's fine. I shall crop these leads. And then we'll put the LEDs in. It's going nicely so far. I could even test this after I've put the LEDs in, even without putting it in the circuit board, on the bottle, should I say, because uh, all that other, that resistor is just across the power rails. Now, here's an interesting thing. I'm going to put some solder on the uh, big pads here, just at the moment. An interesting thing is uh, the resistance of your USB lead will play a significant part in how bright the LEDs are and how hot the lamp gets because if you use a cheap crappy lead that isn't really capable of passing uh, an amp without a significant voltage drop then it's not going to operate at full capacity. So use a good quality lead. Right, let's bring this jig up then. And we'll stick the red LEDs in. So this uh, is a really handy jig thing. It's a circuit board assembly device. You adjust these clips to hold the circuit board in place. So I'm just going to do it like this. And it basically, you put the components in, and then you put the lid on, the foam holds them in place. It just makes it so easy to manufacture. So all the positives are going on the outside. And I'm going to actually be careful here that I put the reds in pairs, because if you put a red and a blue in parallel, the, the red would light, but the blue might not light at all, because the red would pull the voltage down, it would hog all the current, because the, the red LEDs just have that slightly lower forward voltage. So I'm going to do this as alternate pairs of red and blue. So in go the red ones first, and then I'll double check. In the previous circuit boards, all the LEDs were biased with the positive connection going to the top, but it was easier in the case of this design, and more compact, to have the positive on the outside as one circular track going around all the LEDs. And no matter how much effort you take, sometimes you do screw up. It's just a part and parcel of uh, doing electronic assembly. People make mistakes. It's just ours tend to be louder and involve smoke and flames. So I'm going to put this lid on. This is where I just obliterate the image in the camera. 
and it hooks over, hinges down, and it's like little metal baggage catches here. Clip on and clamp down, turn it over, and let's zoom down on this and see how clear it's going to be. And I shall start soldering those LEDs. In comes the soldering iron again. Let's go on the outside first. I'll just solder one LED at a time, LED lead at a time, the positive initially. And I start with the positive because it's not got the LED mounted on it, the actual chip, which means uh, if I have to readjust the LED for squareness and reheat that pad, I mean, it's just something I do, uh, then it's not so critical, it's not going to give it too much heat. So that is me down to five millimetres of solder, so I'll just grab a bit more. Pull a bit more off the roll, and solder iron comes in again. The only way to uh, learn to solder is to solder. It's the, the only way to learn to weld is to weld. There's n you can read books and it will give you lots of useful information, but um, it won't uh, show you how to do it physically. Sometimes it's better to see someone else do it. This is where YouTube is a complete winner. YouTube is great. You've probably done it. You've probably looked up the tutorials on YouTube. It's just a fantastic resource for that. So. Everything's looking square. I shall now solder the positive leads. Then I'll crop the blue LED leads down and we'll stick the blue LEDs in. And then we'll give it a test and see how it looks. Then I shall go and get the bottle, which I have already attached the... Oh, I've just soldered onto a lead that isn't, a lead that isn't actually there. I was distracted there. That's all right. I'll use the desoldering wick to whip that solder back off. Then I get the bottle, which is already... Uh, got the resistor uh, silicone down to it, but uh, it was going to take so long for the silicone to cure that uh, I just decided let's uh, make the circuit board while that's curing. And then because the resistor in it, the heater resistor is central, it should just hopefully slot into the circuit board. It might not, you just never know. Only one way to find out. Right, where's that rogue pad? I have splash solder over a rogue pad. Where is my desoldering wick? Let's remove that little splash of soda, which is covering one of the holes. Oh. This is where a bit of uh, flux might have helped. No, it's fine, it's cleared. That's one of the advantages of a one millimeter hole. It's uh, quite big in component hole size terms, so it's much easier to clean the soda off it. So here are the blue LEDs. We've got eight blue LEDs going on. Four pairs. Oh, too many LEDs. Oh, LEDs everywhere. Someone was asking how many LEDs do you have? I don't know, I've got thousands. And they span my history of LEDs. I got my first LED when I was at the age of about, probably about 11-ish, 12-ish. That was a very long time ago. I think it may have been in the early days of LEDs when they were considered a specialist component. I can remember going in with my mum into Glasgow into a place called Marshall's, which was an old electronic shop there. And literally, we asked, do you have any LEDs? And the lady behind the counter brought up a selection of about four. There was a cheap green one, and there were increasingly expensive ones, right up to the sort of diamond-shaped one that was red. And I wanted the diamond-shaped one, the expensive one, and my mum said no. Damn. So I got the green one, and I actually came back home and not knowing how to use an LED, it was the latest thing, I um, connected it straight across a battery, but fortunately it was a one and a half volt battery, and I wonder what was, I don't know the technology of the LED, because I'm just going to zoom out here, a green LED should require about two volts before it lights, but it lit on the, the big D-cell nine volt battery, and I had loads of fun with that LED, but I never damaged it. I wonder where it went. It's probably still knocking about somewhere unless it got swept into a bin at some point as the latest stuff, stuff came out. A historic LED. So in the frame goes into the... The circuit board goes into the frame and the LED is with the positive to the outside again. Yeah, I've been using LEDs for a very, very long time. 
back from when uh, the brightest LEDs, the super bright LEDs, or hyper bright and ultra bright, they just invented loads of increasingly ridiculous names for them, and yet they were all blown away. When the gallium nitride blue LEDs came out, and suddenly there was competition, they had to produce the bright red LEDs to match them. Uh, then the intensity shot up way beyond what you used to get before. Beforehand, they cheated. They'd uh, use wavelengths that were bordering on the darker end of red and just quote the lumen value. So you thought, bought it thinking it was going to be a bright LED, but it was a darker red colour. So uh, 660 nanometer. So you thought you were getting a really bright LED. And also they tended to uh, focus it into a really tight beam just to make it look as though, to, so they could quote higher intensity figures. It was all a bit cheating. If you look at the medical industry and their use of red LED therapy, red light therapy, it all tends to be based around 660 nanometers from that era, simply because that was what the bright LEDs were available in. So they used to go, yes, using the prestigious 660 nanometer wavelengths. Okay, let's uh, so do these. Is this going to work? I'm pretty sure it'll work. Sometimes it doesn't work. But, am I blowing my own trumpet here? Often it works first time. Even a completely new design. I've, when you've been doing electronics for a certain length of time, you get good enough that you can predict the results and go straight to copper. Sometimes that goes wrong. A strobe circuit board comes to mind, a fairly high power fairground strobe circuit board. That I connected it up and there was a massive bang and the circuit board just exploded in my face. It was great. Stunned silence and then I burst out laughing because it was just so silly. All that work leading up to that point and then the explosive failure. And the reason it had failed explosively is because right at the very last minute I'd made a slight design modification. I thought, oh, I could route the track down there because why didn't I do that before? And it turned out the reason I didn't do it before was because I basically shorted uh, the supply rails. And because I was plugging in down below on my uh, socket at the floor, my face was right in front of it and I plugged it in. It was quite impressive. So two more solder joints to do. Crop off the leads and then this is ready to test and see if it lights. Will it light? Will all the LEDs light? I think they probably will. But I have been wrong before. This is a relatively simple design so it should be alright. So cropping two at a time. These uh, leads on these LEDs are actually made of steel. Must be a specific reason for that. You can get brass lead LEDs, but they tend to be used in the signage industry, maybe for anti-corrosion. Right, okay, bench power supply. Bench power supply on. The voltage is set to five volts, how convenient. Uh, let's stick this lead onto this pad. And this one onto that pad. Let's get a good connection first. Yeah, see, I'm not getting a good connection here because let's not bridge out the resistors as well and nook the LEDs. Yep, that's looking pretty good. Yep, that is nice and bright. Yep, not getting great connection onto soda pads at the back, but that is looking very good. Right, so that just needs sat onto the bottle now. So that is going to happen next. Let's turn off these things and go and get the bottle. And now for something completely different, mainly because Patreon supporter Richard Benson said, definitely don't do this in the style of William Osman. Oh, challenge accepted. Yo, what's up, family? It's your boy here, BigClive.com. Remember to subscribe and smash that like button with your penis to make lots of little baby like buttons. Oh, yeah. Gay Dalek approves of this message. We now return to our normal program material. So here is the glitter vial I'm going to use. And uh, this one is paired with this base. This is the one, incidentally, that my dad cut the lid off. He thought the glitter lamps were either full of nerve gas or p gasoline or uh, something. And I gave this glitter lamp as a gift to my mum. And the next time I visited, the lid had been cut off and the bottle had been opened and the contents had been poured out somewhere. Very, very odd. 
but that was very much the style of my dad. So what I've done here is to, rather than actually put the resistor on the circuit board and then silicon it onto the base here, what I've done is I've actually siliconed a 10 ohm resistor onto the base of the bottle. And I've chosen 10 ohm because at 5 volts, the USB supply, it's going to pass about half an amp, which is going to be half an amp at 5 volts, it's going to be 2.5 watts. It's a 2 watt resistor, but it's got extra thermal dissipation here because I smeared silicon sealant, general purpose silicon sealant, onto the base of the bottle in the middle, placed the resistor on, then smeared a bit more over the top of the resistor, licked my finger and just damped it all around it. And there's two options here. You could uh, either have patience and you could leave the uh, silicon to cure naturally, or you could do what I did and exert same extreme uh, impatience. And I stuck a couple of crop clips on from the power supply and I passed five volts through it to dissipate 2.5 watts. And I set it up vertically. And after a while, once it heated up, you could actually see the uh, acetic acid. Have you ever smelled... Have you ever smelled silicon and it's got that sort of acetic -y, acid -y aroma, that standard silicon. And uh, you could see the vapour of the acid coming off it. It was a distinct trail of the acid and it cures very quickly when you do that, when you're, you're heating it. Incidentally, it's not normally recommended to use acid, acetic acid curing silicon in electronic equipment because it does cause corrosion. But in this instance, uh, because it's out in the open as such and it was uh, heated and all the acid has been driven out, it should be okay. So now that that resistor is securely secured onto the base of the bottle, I'm going to feed the contacts onto the circuit board. I say that, I'm going to hopefully they're going to go in. Yes, they are going to go in. And I'm going to press the circuit board down. And this is where it's a bit tricky. I'm going to have to stand it vertically and then it's going to be totally out of focus because you can only focus on certain areas while you're filming. This has been a bit of an education now, doing YouTube in camera activity. Uh, learning how to use your camera equipment is quite important. It's quite a significant part of YouTube. So I'm going to sit this down here. I could focus on this, you know, I could just go like that and then it would focus and then you'd see what I was doing. But it's not very bright because all the lighting is down below. Uh, and I'm going to solder the lead on. And now I'm going to have to focus back down the bench, am not I? Was that a bad move? Yes, it was. Not to worry. So now the circuit board is uh, fastened on. I'm going to crop those leads. Now, this is totally out of focus. Hold on. Let me bring in something to focus on. Here we go. This is a nice box with text. And the text is important because of the way uh, digital focus works. It basically compares adjacent pixels. It focuses right through the full range, or more or less the full range, and looks for the sharpest contrast in pixels. Because when uh, you're out of focus, uh, the blurring causes a sort of soft contrast, but when you're in focus, it causes a sharp contrast, and that's how it detects. Right, so now I just need the USB lead and this base that my dad hated so much because he obviously thought it was electrically and chemically dangerous. Somewhere at some point in time, someone has put this rumour on the internet that uh, glitter lamps contain nerve gas. I don't think they do. I don't think it'd be allowed to be sold. It's time for a Poundland product to make an appearance. I, I'd like to point out I'm not sponsored by Poundland. They just sell some very useful things. And this is a fabric lead. And I really bought this because I want to see how easy it is to actually purpose. So that is, look at that. It just actually... it. Just the fabric sleeve is literally just over the top of a PVC lead. That's good. So I'm going to thread this into the base here. Maybe I shouldn't, uh, actually, I couldn't really do anything but snip the connector off. Uh, then I'm going to strip this cable. And I've tested this cable. Uh, you're going to need a lead that can easily pass the required current. So I'm just going to nibble around the plastic here. If you use an excessively cheap lead, it won't be able to pass enough current. And keep in mind that this lamp, the resistor in it, is drawing about uh, 500 milliamps, and then there's LEDs. So you want a cable that's not going to drop too much voltage. Uh, polarity is important. Sometimes in these leads, red is negative and black is positive. It's a bit random, so let's check that out. Let's bring my strippers in, which are probably not set for the correct... Uh, gauge, but let's give it a go and see if it is going to strip it. It has stripped. Excellent. 
Let's put some solder in those to bond the ends together, to tie everything together and get it ready to stick onto the circuit board. Solder, solder yarn, and flow. Right, let's plug that into a generic USB power supply. Let's plug it into this generic ASDA power supply, alias the UK version of Walmart. And let's bring in the meter and check the polarity. And we do that by setting this to the 20 volt range, which will cover the nicely the 5 volt range. And I'll put the red lead in the positive and the black lead in the negative. And if it shows, it's showing 5 volts and it's not showing the negative symbol, so the polarity is correct. That's a good start. So I'm going to unplug that from there. Technically speaking, you could power one of these glitter lamps from a USB power bank, but I'm not sure how long it would last because it is drawing quite a lot of current because it is using a heater to heat the liquid and create the sort of flow of the diamonds. Oh, the diamonds. Now, these uh, crystals in here, these are the typical polystyrene wedding table scatter crystals, but these ones are special because they've got the chrome coating on them. And what's really interesting about that is, here is another one, it's a pink diamond with the chrome coating, and it's a reject. And let me bring in a bit of paper and show you this. It gives you a clue as to how these are made. So if this is the back of the diamond that is basically coated in the chrome, then there's this sort of flash around it. Flash is the sort of the over injection of the plastic. So they've injected the plastic. There's this sort of flash that appeared around the outside of the mold in a thin film. If, if you're looking at the side, there's the diamond, there's the back of it, and there's the flash. It's just this thin film of plastics come out the side. And it's chrome coated on the back here. And it shows that they must manufacture these by manufacturing them in large sheets. Uh, chrome coating one side, if they're going to chrome coat them, not all of them are chrome coated, and then they must put them into a press that punches them out from that sheet. And that's how they're manufactured. That's quite interesting. They're optically very nice. Polystyrene. Uh, I, we've deduced it's polystyrene from the fact that it's very easy to get the neutral density. It's very clear and it's very easy to float it. I wonder why they don't make glitter out of polystyrene. That would make glitter lamps so much easier. Uh, as it is, the split of gravity is so low we can use salty, salty water to float these. So I'm going to now solder the positive lead. This is where it's going to be out of focus again just because this thing is huge. But this is how it's going to be. So the positive lead is soldered on. And the negative lead is now soldered on. And we're ready to go. That's it more or less complete. So if I power this up, I could plug it into this, you'll see the lamp light. Oh yes, that is looking quite nice, is it not? Oh, let's, uh, let's turn the light off here and take exposure off and... Oh, that is looking quite sparkly indeed, is it not? That is projecting patterns and everything, that's lovely. Okay. Right, I'm going to set this back in the bottle, and I'm going to use a power supply. I'm going to actually use a Poundland 2 amp power supply, the luxury Poundland one, which doesn't actually cost a pound, it costs two pounds. And I'm going to use that to power this, and we'll see how it looks. Well, I'd say this is a very good result. It's producing a lovely effect. Keep in mind that this version of the Gillian's Diamonds lamp is using the chromed clear crystals. So the chrome acts like a glitter lamp and it projects the beams in all directions. If you're using just the clear crystals on their own, the most of the effect would be in the lamp, but it would still be projecting this pattern, but a lesser degree. The power supply is a standard USB power supply. In this case, the power consumption is just over half an amp. So technically speaking, about three watts is the power consumption. And that means you could leave this running all year long, 24 seven without worrying about power consumption because the cost over the year would be about three pounds or five dollars. It would be nothing. The movement in the liquid is very good for such a low power, mainly because in traditional glitter lamps, 
the lamp is not directly connected to the bottle. In this case, the resistor is directly connected to the bottle and therefore dissipates the heat directly into the liquid. So what you see is the thermal dissipation from that resistor interpreted as fluid flow. Now you'll notice there's an ambient music track playing in the background and you're about to see a section of video of just a close-up of these diamonds floating around in that ambient music and there's a prize up for grabs. The music is from a film, a prominent film, but it's been time-shifted, it's been slowed down greatly so that an originally choral type music is now a very soft ambient background track. And the first person to correctly identify the composer of that music in the comments will win a random prize. I can't tell you what the prize is yet because I don't know what the prize is. I shall choose it based on the winner. So if you can identify that music, then I shall send you a random item. Let's take a look at the crystals. Mm -hmm. 